Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to see you in lively debates. Uh, although it's after lunchtime, I hope you keep on that energy for the questions after the talk. Um, I'm Lena Meyer-Hein from Heidelberg. I'm chairing this session with Hervé Lombard from Canada. Uh, and the, the session is on learning from unbalanced samples. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Carol Soudre. And she's presenting the paper 3D Multi-Rater RCNN for Multimodal Multi-Class Detection and Characterization of Extremely Small Objects. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, Carol and I would like to talk to you this afternoon about the work that we have been doing on uh, 3D adaptation of region-based CNN for the detection and characterization of very, very small objects. Can, yeah, here we go. Um, so for, for today, we'd like first to uh, talk to you a bit about the context and the motivation of this work, and especially cerebral small vessel disease and the different challenges that we have in detecting uh, simultaneously different uh, subtypes of lesions. Then I will walk you through the proposed solution, which is a suite adaptation of uh, RCNN some uh, discussion about the implementation and the training, and then presenting uh, some of our experiments with the data and initial results before going to the ongoing work that we are doing. So what is a cerebral small vessel disease? Some of you may know about it. Basically, when your brain ages, um, you have also issues with your vessels that become stiffer, become more occluded, and in consequence, the supply in the surrounding tissue is not adequate anymore, and you may have lesions that appear. Those lesions may be um, as generic as white matter hyperintensity lesions that, is, uh, that are actually quite well known, or uh, can be enlarged perivascular spaces like hunes, microbleeds, etc. So here on this uh, central picture, you can see actually three different um, acquisitions, T1, T2, flare images with uh, three uh, subtypes of these lesions, EPVS, lacunes, and white matter hyperintensities. These lesions, they are um, uh, associated with uh, different risk factors, in particular cardiovascular risk factors, age, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, other genetic factors, and so on. And they have been associated with a large number of clinical symptoms, including the problems of decrease in processing speed, uh, early on uh, onset of dementia, faster cognitive decline, and so on. As you can see from the picture, we have very different um, descriptions for those, uh, for those lesions, some being linear, some being elongated, some being very round, some more focal, some confluent with different intensities. But if we want to understand better the clinical relevance of this observation, we need to be able to quantify them through so either the volume, the shape, the account, and the location. Now, that has been properly done, and already there is quite a lot body of work on white matter hyperintensities that are quite large, but it's much more difficult and much, much sparser in the case of EPVS and lacunes that are very, very small objects. Now I will talk a bit more about the EPVS and lacunes. So EPVS are basically the space between vessels and glia cells. Usually we think that they are used for uh, lymphatic clearance and the clearance of amyloid in particular. So when they enlarge, it means that uh, there is a retention of the fluid. And some people say that it's a marker of atrophy. Some others say that it's a problem of clearance. Anyway, it's not normal when you have too many and they are too big. Usually they are linear in shape, but we'll see about that later. Lacunes on the other side, they are in fact, total in fact of the tissue underneath that is completely fluid filled. It's one of the criteria for vascular dementia and they're extremely uh, important to report when they happen on strategic tracts. They are ovoid in shape and often you find a rim of white matter hyperintensity around it. So until then you would tell me, oh actually it's pretty easy to distinguish between EPVS and lacunes, right? One linear, one ovoid, one with a rim of white matter identities, the other one not. Actually, it's not that straightforward. Lacunes, 
Um, as you can see in the first row, you can have some examples where this is uh, actually easy to distinguish between a lacune and an EPVS, one properly run with a rim and so on, the other one very linear, very fluid field, all fine. Then you move to the second row and you are, mm, actually I might not know what's happening there. Which one is an EPVS, which one is a lacune? Are they just EPVS through white matter appendices? How can I know? So indeed, you have a lot of variability in the presentation of these lesions that are very difficult to detect, to distinguish between from one another, and obviously you get uh, difficulty in getting reliable ground truths from radiologists. In addition to that, they are extremely small. Um, so you have usually uh, items that are less than five voxels. It can go up to 30, 50, but rarely uh, above that. And on top of that, you have a large imbalance between these classes. So for one lacunes, you may have 100 enlarged perivascular spaces. So how did we try to tackle this problem of detecting and uh, characterizing the CPVS and lacunes? So we decided to go for an adaptation of a region-based CNN in, uh, in 3D. So the work, the 3D RCNN works, and uh, RCNN works in general, that you need a backbone um, feature extraction. Then you need a um, place where you propose some regions that you want to analyze further. And then you perform the final classification and final refinement about your, your different regions. In addition here, since we had multiple raters that were looking uh, at our images, we introduced a multi rater step to understand better the behavior of each rater. So one step at a time. First, the backbone. So we need to get to extract features that are relevant for the detection of uh, EPVS and lacunes. For, for that, we decided to regress uh, the distance map to the segmentation using high res net as backbone um, network, and we use the weighted sampling for the smooth distance map. Then uh, we uh, trained it with the root mean square error loss. Once we had our feature extracted, that was a question of how to find the boxes. So in the 2D version of the RCNN, you have for all uh, possible voxel different boxes that, ca that can be uh, proposed, and you have to say which ones are positive, which ones are negative, which one contain an element, which one don't. Here, in 3D, it's completely impossible because it's too intractable. So what we decided to do instead was to regress the distance from the closest element center of mass and try to see if we were close enough, then it would be a positive, uh, a positive sample voxel. And we did that with a balanced training, just saying the box is positive, we need to look into it or not. And we used a smooth distance uh, loss to uh, regress the distance to the center of mass. Now to the refinement, now that we have proposal boxes that we can look into, we can properly adjust the location of the center of mass, adjust the scale, but also classify from the average of our different raters what is the most probable class. So we had four classes, is there nothing, lacunes, EPVS, or I know that it's something between lacunes or EPVS, but I can't decide and decide it. And for the multi-rater encoded, the only thing that we did is basically to allow for each um, um, box to be classified according to the choices of each rater in order to try to reproduce the rater behavior. So for implementation, we implemented uh, everything using NIFTUNET, and uh, we prepared our data by scale stripping our brain images, bias field corrected them, and we normalized all the intensity with respect to the white matter statistics. For the training, we used patches of 64 cubes windows with a stretch training, meaning that we first starting by properly uh, uh, performing the feature extraction to the regression maps, then we fixed all those weights and went on to the region proposal uh, network uh, branch training. Once it was trained, we fixed it and then went on to the classification path. For the inference, we allowed for a maximum of 300 boxes per patch and we used non-maximum suppression to, uh, to avoid too much of all overlap between our boxes. We used a score map of uh, the score maps that we obtained from the proposal uh, network and we special did it to make sure that we obtained the right boxes and to use further the distance map to uh, choose the right ones. 
Now for the data and the experiment. So we use data from the Sabre study, which is a study run in London uh, with a high number of uh, elderly people, 782 uh, acquired uh, data, MRI, with T1, T2, and flare isotropic uh, data. Uh, on those subjects, we chose actually 16 that had a very high lesion burden, and we segmented all of them using uh, ITK SNAP. So we ended up with uh, 4,148 elements. And you see really the discrepancy between the number of subjects that could seem pretty low and the number of elements that we detected. Once we had all these elements, we asked our six raters to play a game. Basically, they were presented with this type of, uh, of image, with snapshot and zoomed in version on the three different orientations of the elements, and they had to tell us which, wa which was the class that they were classifying it into, so as the four class that I, de I described earlier. On the left bottom, you can see uh, the frequency of the different element sizes, and you can really see that we have a lot of elements that were less than five voxels. So we decided basically to make the life of our network a bit easier and only trained on uh, uh, elements that were more than five voxels, since they are supposed to be more representative and supposed to be also more associated with the pathology and the clinical symptoms. In the, in the end, we ended up with 2,442 elements. What you can see as well is that even on those elements that are bigger than five voxels, the discrepancy between raters were quite high because we had only 37% uh, um, of the cases that were uh, considered almost always the same by all raters. So there were only 37% uh, of cases in which everybody agreed. We used 14 subjects for training and two subjects for testing. And here are some of our results. So on the um, left, top left, you can see first the ground truth. So in green are basically the segmentation. So you can see that it's very imbalanced data. Middle is the distance map that we regress out and the corresponding score map. What we saw is that we obtained a very decent sensitivity with 72% of sensitivity. And we observed as well that the performance of detection was associated with the size as shown in the box plot on the right, but also with the rate of uncertainty, meaning that we had a larger overlap in the boxes that we found with the ground truth when uh, all our raters were telling us that it was something compared to the cases where we had at least one rater telling, uh, telling us that actually this was intelligent. In addition, the the pictures that I show on the bottom, uh, bottom left are actually uh, some things that show that the segmenter wasn't that good when he performed his task. Here's that the network found something, and you see it on the T1 image. The, the, the segmenter missed it, and the network found it, which shows also how difficult it is to validate all these type of network where it's very difficult to get reliable ground truth. And finally, I would like to show you this, uh, this last slide with the proper boxes and with uh, the corresponding uh, probabilities of the uh, classification in the, the four classes. And to interpret it, basically, you can see that the blue boxes correspond to lower probability to classify in one class, and uh, from red to yellow correspond to the, to the probabilities that are higher than 0.5. For instance, if I take uh, the box that is uh, in, uh, in the bottom uh, right part of the brain, blue for lacune, and uh, blue red for EPVS, it's classified in the predicted version, most of the time as EPVS, but also sometimes as nothing, nothing class being uh, quite often associated with uh, very undecided and uncertain data. So in summary, uh, this is a presentation of an adaptation of a region-based CNN, where to uh, extract our feature, we regressed the distance map to the segmentation. And to perform the original proposal, we used actually the distance to the center of mass of our elements, and we further included multi behavior. Obviously, this is a still ongoing work, 
And there is still a lot to do, especially regarding the modeling of the boxes, maybe not only one scale, maybe uh, multiple uh, scales for uh, cuboid, um, paleloids instead of cuboids, maybe not cuboids at all. Um, looking more into uh, uncertainty-driven training according to how certain we are about the classification of our, um, of our data. A bit more on multi-rater analysis to try to understand what is the behavior of our raters and if we can predict which one to believe or not. And as well to try to extend this work to multi-scale detection because here we have EPVS and lacunes that are relatively the same scale, but uh, if we could encompass all type of uh, white matter uh, lesions, that would be much better. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and welcome any question. So coming back to this energy, do you have questions? So maybe I start with one. Um, so you mentioned two subjects for testing, right? And basically you have this trade of uh, determining the number of uh, patients that you can annotate and versus the number of raters that you can have per patient, right? So I have always six raters yes. per, per subject. So basically the raters they, when they were presented with the stars, they didn't know which subject they were looking into. So they did all the snapshot directly. Yes, I understand. But if, basically, if you did it again, how do you, how do you deal with the trade-off between uh, choosing the number of raters per image and choosing how many patients you annotate? Because that's a trade-off, right? If, if you went for less raters per image, you could have more patients. So do, have you developed an intuition? So actually, no, because beforehand, I had to segment everything. So before presenting to the rater, there was a phase of the segmentation. And the segmentation was done only on 16 subjects. OK. So what happened is that uh, there was first the segmentation, and then we took snapshots, because the raters didn't want to segment. For, for them, it was, uh, it was too uh, uh, work consuming at that time. And they, ha they could just classify, but the segmentation task was too much. Mm -hmm. There's one question, yeah, Ismail. Uh, wait, yeah, uh, just curious about the uh, distance map progression. Uh, so you do, uh, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, here. Just, just I'm just curious about the distance map progression. So you, you, you seem to do a filtering step afterward. Uh, is this because, uh, because the, the predictions of, or the regression of distance map is highly noisy? I'm just curious uh, about this. Uh, is, so is basically the problem is that you cannot, so you need to, to have features to get to the regional uh, to to the regional phase of the um, of the detection, and uh, you cannot use a direct segmentation or try anything like that because uh, it's I mean it collapses the network collapses it's too too imbalanced for that so we needed to find out a way to get uh, features that were relevant for our task and at the same time that uh, would be uh, usable and is relatively easily learnable. And in that sense, uh, distance maps are, uh, are quite useful. OK, so the filtering step is not a post-processing step on the distance map. The feature? The filtering step. Filtering. The filtering? Smoothing. There is, uh, the smoothing, there is no smoothing okay. in the, in the um, uh, feature extraction. Okay. What we use for smoothing is just weighted sampling. So basically, in order to learn better, we decided to focus our learning in some, uh, in some spaces according to probabilities, and we use for that a smoothed version of the distance map. Okay. okay. Thanks. Maybe we have one more question. So I can ask maybe one last one then. <laughs> um, I noticed, uh, maybe just me, but I noticed two subjects or two test subjects. Maybe you can comment a bit more. Or you... About why two subjects? Yeah, or... for example. Um, the data set was small, I guess. No, it's, uh... it's, it's so basically the problem that we have is that it's, um, it's very time consuming to, uh, to segment the subject. So it's minimum 
Uh, it's between 20 and 40 hours of work per subject, which is quite considerable. Uh -huh. And we needed to have uh, enough uh, training, training samples. And when we, uh, obviously, if we have more subjects segmented, I mean, it will be, uh, it will be more e easier to, to test what's happening. But what will happen, I mean, that's one of the other part of uh, ongoing work is basically to validate on new subjects and other data coming from other scanners. Yeah, makes sense. As soon as the data yeah. set grows, or yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Um, in interest of time, I guess we can uh, thanks uh, Carol as well. <laughs> so now the next one, uh, maybe if he's around. So I can introduce maybe Sayed Hashemi. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, we. Be